Good morning, everyone. Actually, it's going on afternoon. It's almost noon. It's the 26th July Wednesday hot day. Mark is starting in Chapter 4 today of the, of the Doctrine of Election by Arthur Pink. And he's going to be reading the first three pages of Chapter 4 today. You can get this book by going to greatchristianbooks.com. Doctrine Election Chapter 4, Part 1. Chapter 4 is just as somewhat against our inclinations. We have decided to part against this logical method of exposition. Instead of now proceeding with the orderly unfolding of this doctrine, we pause to deal with the principal objection which is made against that the same. No sooner is the truth set forth of God singling out certain of his creatures to be subject of his special favors and the general cry of protest is heard. No matter how much scripture is quoted to the point nor how many plain passages be induced in illustration, demonstration of it, the majority of those who profess to be Christians loudly object, alleging that such teaching slanders from divine character making God guilty, gross, and justice. Seems then that this difficulty should be met, that replies should be made to such criticism of the doctor. Here we proceed any further with our attempt to give a systematic setting forth of it. In such an age as ours, when the principles of democracy, socialism, and communism, socialism and communism are widely and warmly espoused. The day when human authority and dominion are being more and more despised from the common customs speak evil of dignity, shoot eight. Scarcely surprising that so many who make so make no attention to the balance of authority and holy grip should rebel against the concept of God's being partial. It is unspeakably dreadful to find the great majority of those professed receiving scriptures as divinely Fire gnashing their teeth against his author, informed that he has sovereignly elected people to be to show your treasure, and to hear them charging him with being a hateful tyrant, a monster of cruelty. Yet such blasphemies only go to show the carnal mind's enmity against God. It's not because we have the hope of converting such rebels from the error of their ways. We feel constrained to take up the present aspect of our subject, though it may please God in His infinite grace to use these people's lines to enlightening, enlightening, and convicting. A few of them, though rather is it that some of God's dear people are disturbed by the gravities of His enemies and know not how to answer no mind to the subjection that God makes a sovereign selection among His creatures predestinates them to blessings which we told. And countless millions of their fellows and such partiality makes them guilty of treating the latter unjustly. And yet the fact stares them the face of their hand both in creation and providence of God and disputes. His mercy is most evenly there's no there's no there's no equality in his bestowed bestowments either in his physical health and strength, mental capacity, social status for the comforts of this life. Why then should we be staggered when we learn that his spiritual blessing is true and deeply? Before proceeding further, it should be pointed out to find their false scheme. Scheme or religion is to depict the character of God in such a way that it's agreeable to the taste and carnal and hard, acceptable to crave human nature, and that can only be done by a species of misrepresentation. The ignoring of those that his prerogatives, affections, which are unchecked, which are unobjectionable and disimportant, and that emphasizing of those of his attributes which appeal to their selfishness, such as his love, mercy, and long suffering that let the character of God be taken as it is actually portrayed in scriptures in the Old Testament as well as the New and nine out of every ten of church goers. Frankly, states that they will find it possible to love him. 
plain fact that dear reader that to the present generation most high and holy writ to unknown God it is just because people today are so ignorant of divine character and so lacking in godly fear that they are quite in the dark as the nature and glory of divine justice. Assuming to arraign it, this is an age of blatant irreverence, irreverence wherein lumps of animal clay dare to strive. But the Almighty ought not not to leave our forefathers so the way of the day their children reaping of their own ends. Divine rights of king was scoffed at and subdued by the sires, and now their offspring repudiate the divine rights of the king of kings. Unless the proposed rights of the creature are respected, our motives have no respect for the creature, the creator, and if it's the highest sovereignty and absolute dominion or overall, be insisted upon, they hesitate not to vomit forth their condemnation of them. Even communication screw up good manners, First Corinthians 13, 1533. God's own people are in danger of being affected by the poisonous gas, which now fills the air of the living world. Not only is the mild semantic atmosphere obtaining in most of the churches serious minutes, the Christian leaders in each was a serious tendency to humanize God, viewing his perfections through our own intellectual lenses instead of through the glass of scripture, interpreting, interpreting, and interpreting his attributes by human qualities that were said of this very thing that God explained of old when he said, Thou Father, that I will say altogether such a one as thyself, Psalm 21. This is a solemn warning for us to take the heart of the meaning of when we read of God's mercy and righteousness. We are very apt to think of any according qualities of man's mercy and justice. This is a serious mistake. The Almighty is not measured by any standard, by human, human standard. He is so infinitely above us that any comparison is utterly impossible, and therefore, I of madness for any finite, finite creature, finite creatures, finite creatures, and getting on the way to hold us. And again, we need to be much regarding as the Father would make invidious, invidious distinctions between the divine perfection. The example is quite wrong for us to suppose that God is more glorious in grace and mercy than He is in power and majesty. This mistake is often made. How many are more thankful to God for blessing them with health than they are for bestowing the gospel upon them? Does it therefore follow that God's goodness and giving material things is greater than His goodness, bestowing spiritual blessings? Certainly not. Thank you, Mark. Tomorrow we'll continue this chapter. You all have a good day. God bless.